Well, hello and good morning, online community. My name is Jesus. I'm our high school pastor here at Water of Life. And my name is Lauren. I am our high school ministry leader here at Water of Life. We're really excited to be here with our online community today. Yeah, and if you're visiting us for the first time online and you've never seen a service here at Water of Life before, could you do us a favor? We would love to get to know you a little bit more as well as uh, let you know a little bit more about who we are as a church. You can text NEW HERE to 818-818. That's NEW HERE to 818-818. Well, if you have been around Water of Life for any period of time, you know this. We have a lot going on here at the campus, and this coming Sunday is no exception, right? This is the first time we've done this in over a year. It's our largest outreach of the year as well. Uh, Lauren, can you tell them what that is? Yes. So next Sunday, we have our trunk or treat. We are so excited to do this again because we haven't done this in over a year. Um, and so we're very excited to come together as just a church and open our doors to the community, really just to have a safe place, a fun place for them to celebrate October 31st and just to have fun. And also, it's just such a great opportunity for the community to step onto our campus for the first time. But this night is full of fun and excitement. Our family loves to come every year. It's a great place to just come, get lots of candy, and have fun. Yeah, well, speaking of lots of candy, right, there is a way for you to partner with us in this event um, by donating some candy. We want to have a lot of candy for the community that come here, for the kids that come here. Uh, sugar them up, right? It's always a good thing. So if you would like to donate candy, you can do so uh, during this week. Drop it off here at the campus or at our offices on Miller. We are also in need of more trunks. So if you'd like to decorate a trunk, you can do that. There'll be a QR code up here in a moment that you can you put your camera in front of and just open up that link and sign up. Or if there's maybe just an area that you're like, you know what, I just want to serve at the event wherever I'm needed, you can sign up for that as well. It's an amazing time. And honestly, it, I can't tell you, the amount of times that I've uh, been here at Water of Life, the amount of years that I've been here, um, I hear stories all the time from people that their first time walking onto the Water of Life campus was through a trunk or tree and how God just got a hold of them during that outreach. Such an awesome time for us to, like Lauren said, be able to partner with the community and give them a safe place to come. Yeah, that is awesome. So don't forget, join us October 31st, 6 to 9 p.m. here on our campus. Yeah, and then the following week, right, that's November 7th, uh, we have an amazing, uh, there's an amazing thing, I should say, that we do here at Water of Life, and that is to uh, come together as a church periodically throughout the year and to worship alongside each other and to pray with each other, and we're going to do that next Sunday. We are November 7th from 5 to 7. We are having our night of worship. This is actually our last night wow. of worship for the year. The year is flying by, That's right, crazy. Jesus? Um, this is our last night of worship for the year, so we'd love to just come together as a church community, especially before just the holiday seasons, which we know even this year can be a lot different for yeah. people. Um, just a heavier year, and to be able to come together as a church community and pray for not only just our community around us, but the world mm -hmm. is so awesome. Um, another thing that's super exciting about this night of worship, Jesus, is that there is a kids' night of worship. And this is something that just speaks so dear to my heart. My kids have um, now c come to love coming to night of worship because they get to come and do their own night of worship. And so join us. If you have kids age um, kindergarten through fifth grade, same night, November 7th, 5 to 7 p.m. in the MPV, they're going to have their own special night of worship. Yeah, I love that our Wall Kids ministry does that, that they set up a time for uh, the kids to be able to grow in their relationship with Jesus and during this special night as well. Well, as we are getting ready for our service, we want to remind you before we go into a new uh, series today in Ruth that we are going to have communion. So make sure that you grab your communion elements, whatever they may be. They could be crackers, water, whatever it is. And um, why don't we do this as we get ready to move in? Lauren, can you... Pray for us and prepare our hearts as we go into service. Absolutely. 
Jesus, we just love you, God. And Lord, we just pray um, right now for this service today. We pray for each person who has tuned in to our, from our online community, Lord. We just pray that your just peace and loving presence just comes and resides in their household right now, Lord. And Jesus, we just pray over this service, Lord, that um, it just use this message just to speak directly to each person tuning in. So we just praise you, Lord. We thank you for who you are. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, guys, we love you, and we will see you afterwards. Well, good morning, Water of Life. How are you guys doing today? We want to welcome our uh, online campus, Townsville and Upland campus, and of course, everybody here at the Worship Center. You guys ready to worship our Father today? Here we go.
Amen. Why don't you stay standing where you are and we're going to continue in worship, but we're going to take communion together as a family. If you didn't receive communion elements when you walked in, why don't you just go ahead and slip your hand up. We have some guest services team who would love and to serve you communion. And for those that are online, I know you're not with us in person, but we would love for you to also participate in communion with us today as we take this as a community. So go ahead and grab some bread, grab some juice, and as we get ready to take communion. As I was thinking of communion and, and thinking about worship this morning, I, I got excited, man, because I love how worship this morning celebrated, reminding us that, that our God is enthroned, that our God reigns, that our God has the victory. Anybody excited that our God has the victory this morning? And because he has the victory, we also in Jesus have the victory, that we have the victory. But here's why I love communion, because communion gives us this opportunity to pause, be still, and remember that our victory came at a cost. That our victory came at a cost, that it wasn't something that we earned, it wasn't something that we deserved, but it came with a price. And that price was Jesus' broken body. That price was a Jesus' battered body body, blood pouring out. That cross was a blood-stained cross, and I think it's important for us as followers of Jesus to take moments and be reminded that our victory came at a cost, because it's in those moments that it creates in us this level of humility and gratitude as you remember that our victory came at a cost. I want to read a few verses. You can go ahead and take your communion out. Maybe go ahead and take the bread. And I'm going to read 1 Corinthians 11:23, and, and here's what it reads. It says, For I, I pass on to you what I received from the Lord himself. On the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took some bread and gave thanks to God for it. Then he broke it in pieces and said, This is my body which is given for you. Do this to remember me. So Jesus, we thank you for the bread that represents your body that was broken for us. God, your scripture says that, that it's by your stripes we are healed. Lord, we thank you for, that you endured the pain, that your love for us was so deep that you endured the pain and a broken body that we can experience healing and wholeness. Take the bread. And the scripture continues on, verse 25, in the same way, he took the cup of wine after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed with his blood. Do this to remember me as often as you drink it. So, Lord, we thank you for the blood. Lord, we thank you for the blood. Your Bible says that without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins, God, and we're grateful that while we were yet sinners, while we were yet far away, while we were in our mess despite our flaws and our faults, you loved us enough to go to the cross. Thank you for your blood. Take the cup. There's going to be some guest services coming with buckets to collect on the end of the aisles. But before we wrap up, I want to read verse 26, and it says this. For every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you are announcing the Lord's death until he comes again. And here's why I get excited. We're going to go back into worship because in the same way that we remember and acknowledge his death, it's also the same way that we remember and acknowledge the victory that Jesus has and the victory that we have in him. Anybody excited that we serve a God who reigns today? Let's worship together.
if you could just turn and greet someone and welcome them to Water of Life. God bless you. Enjoy the rest of the service. That's a great video. I just had a problem with, um, Ruth just had her fingernails done before she did that. Did you notice? Uh, I'm not quite sure how that worked out uh, in 1000 BC, but hey, you know, it's a good video. No, I'm playing with you. How are you today? You know, we're really glad that you're here with us. If you're online, we want to welcome you, or one of our other campuses, we want to welcome you as well. And we're going to jump into um, a new series on the book of Ruth. Some of you have been around here a while. You know, we did this seven or eight years ago, and it's a great book. And I just thought, man, there's so much good stuff in Ruth. We should circle back around and do that again. But just a reminder, if you weren't here at the beginning of the hour, uh, Jakeem did a great job uh, with announcements, but he did a great job with communion just now. <laughs> I just like love to watch our young pastors grow, man. It's amazing to watch him and Marcus and... Lauren and some of our younger pastors is to watch them grow up in Christ and really start leading. It's amazing to watch. So, but uh, he was talking about trunk or treat. And um, so I was going to have you come up here and dance in your pumpkin dress. But no, no, I'm joking with you. <laughs> She's like, I, I know you were having a group hug with the girls here a minute ago and they were all checking out your dress like, wow, you have pumpkins all over your dress, don't you? Yeah, you're ready for trunk or treat. But trunk or treat is our biggest outreach of the year at Water of Life. It's something we really prayed about years and years ago saying, God, how can we get into our community? We want to touch our community, we want to make a difference. And trunk or treat was what we ended up with. And this was before anybody was doing trunk or treat. Okay, so we brought some cars in the parking lot, we opened the back trunks, we put some candy in them. And I, I had our college pastor at the time said, listen, we should do this. And I go, go, go do it with your college students, see what happens. And he said, 300 people showed up. And I said, 300 people showed up. And you had like 10 cars out there with trunks? He goes, yeah. So the next year we did it, we had 50 cars and 1,000 people showed up and then we had 100 cars and then 5,000 and then we had 200 cars and then 15,000. And it's been an amazing time to touch our community because it allows for people to come on the campus safely, bring their children on the campus safely. And friends, when people are in crisis, that's where they come, they come back. So this is a huge outreach for us. We still need you to get on board. A bunch of you are like, oh, I have the COVID coma, Pastor. I'm not signed up yet. You know, you need to get out of the COVID coma back in the race, right? <laughs> How many know that? So there's work to be done in the kingdom of God, friends. There's work to be done. We gotta reach people. And people are still perishing, families are hurting. We need to reach people. So we got all kinds of things for you to do to help with parking, face painting, just general serving all over the place. We need candy, all kinds of stuff that is happening out there. And you can um, go at walltrunkertreat.com and get signed up. So Father, we wanna come to you and pray about next weekend that we would take a day that's meant for darkness and turn it into light that it would become a blessing for you, Father, that we would reach people that would never be reached any other way, that we would touch lives for the, for the name in the, of Jesus and the kingdom of God. And Father, we want to thank you for the book of Ruth. As we jump in, Holy Spirit, we pray for you to teach us. There's so much to glean from the book of Ruth. There's so much to learn from the journey and the story. So we pray that you would come and teach us today in the name of Jesus. Everybody said... So the book of Ruth is an amazing book. First, you just have to think like this. It's about breaking down dividing walls. So you have a girl named Ruth who really should have never been where she ended up being in the journey with God. She got grace and grace and more grace. Anybody love grace? Anybody need grace? Because that's Ruth. Ruth was a girl who just wouldn't let go of God. She wouldn't let go of God. She wouldn't let go of God. And God broke down the dividing walls for her. So when we start talking about Ruth, you gotta understand it's a story, a great story, about a mother, her sons, a father, some daughter-in-laws, a bunch of people, but it ends up circling around an ordinary girl 
who changes the world. I mean, you are here because of her. And I know you don't get that. This is like 1,000 to 1,100 BC. You, many of you think, this is so far out of my zone. No, 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 this is a prophetic story for you. This is a prophetic picture of God. And see, if you don't know the story, let me just go to the end and then we'll work our way back the next six weeks. But she, this girl Ruth, becomes the great, 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 great grandmother of Jesus. Okay, that's a, and, and she should have never been because she was a Moabite. And if you don't know anything about Moabites, they just are not, they were not good people. And so she should have never been in the journey, the lineage of Jesus Christ, but she is. And that ought to give everybody in the room hope because some of us should, don't deserve anything ever from God, most of us, right? And the reality is God is a good God and he loves people, he's crazy about people and that's the story of Ruth. So when you start to look at this picture, let me give you a little backstory so you understand what's happening. It's in the time of Judges, which means that the book of Ruth is one of the oldest books in the Bible. So you gotta go back to people like Samson, people like that, if you're gonna think about Ruth, like where was she? She was before the king, she was before King Saul, before King David, she was in a very, very, very dark time. It was a time after, obviously, Moses and Abraham, but it was a dark time, the time of Judges. There were no kings in the land. Everybody did whatever they wanted to do. Sound like your life. <laughs> now, everybody just is told, do whatever you want to do. It's all good, right? How many of you know it's not good? And it doesn't have destiny in it. And so the book of Ruth is really a shaping book that can shape you, move you, and change you. So when, when, when you start to read it, at first it looks like this. Nothing is happening. You ever been in a place with God where you feel like, what? Nothing is happening. You ever been in those dramatic places where God's just like plowing through stuff and you're like, whoa, look at God go. And this is so great in my life. And then, and then, and then it stops. You ever been there? And then it just goes quiet with God. And you start asking yourself, where is God? What did he do? How come he doesn't speak to me anymore? How come he's not moving anymore? Well, friends, I wanna tell you something. God is always moving. He's always moving. We just don't recognize he's moving. This is a great story of how God was working when nobody thought he was. Nobody saw what he was up to. And friends, in your life, in my life, this happens all the time. We think, where's God at in this? Where's God at? And God is always what? He's always moving. God is always working with people who work with him. He's always touching people who will be touched. The reality is it often happens in difficult times and we don't see it. Because the Bible is about unseen things. Faith is about unseen things. And so we all wanna what? We wanna see it. We wanna see it. But there's a lot of things that you don't see about God. And that doesn't mean they're not real, just as real as the things you can touch and hug and see. And the story of Ruth is about that. Now, when you start to get into it, and those of you are sitting there going, yeah, it's super old, doesn't mean anything to me, you need to remember this. Romans 15, four says, whatever was written in earlier times was written for our instruction, so that through perseverance and encouragement of the scriptures, we could have hope. What does that mean? That means that, listen, all the old stories matter for you. They're prophetic pictures. They're pictures of Jesus and what God is wanting to do in your journey today. So let's pick up the first four or five verses of Ruth and read them together. If you're online, one of our other campuses, let's read them loud, let's read them together. It says, in the days when the judges ruled in Israel, a severe famine came upon the land. So a man from Bethlehem left his home and went to live in the country of Moab, taking his wife and his two sons with him. The man's name was Elimelech, and his wife was Naomi. Then Elimelech died, and Naomi was left with her two sons. The two sons married Moabite women. One married a woman named Orpah, and the other a woman named Ruth. But about 10 years later, both died. This left Naomi alone without her two sons or her husband. This is a sad story, hello? I mean, you got three widows as the leading actors in the story, right? You're like, wow, this is bad. It is bad, and it's obviously very painful. So when you see this, though, you gotta go, what happened, what happened? Well, what happened is God's up to something, but it's all hard. 
Have you ever noticed that God moves in hard times? I mean, when you don't like it and you're like, oh, this is just hard. Well, obviously, this is hard. It's hard. It says back in verse one, it came about in the days of Judges when things were really bad, there was a famine in the land. Now, there was a guy, and he lived in a place called Bethlehem. Hello, anybody remember that place? Yeah, yeah you're on your way to Christmas already, right? So, see, Bethlehem, Bethlehem was the home of Elimelech and Naomi. But there's a problem. There's a famine in the land. Now, the weirdest thing about this story is that the name Bethlehem actually means the house of bread. And there wasn't any. <laughs> So, so they're hungry, people are hungry, and they have to make some decisions. This is called pressure. You ever been under pressure? And have you made bad decisions? Okay, so it's like point number one in your little outline. Decisions, directions, and destiny. When you get under pressure, friends, be careful about the decisions you make because they can alter your destiny. And that's the picture of the book of Ruth is that you got a family here that they're, they're, they're hurting, there's not enough food for everybody, and they make a decision to do something that ends up not working out really well. So here's the question. Under pressure, when you make decisions, do you have eternity in view? Well, what does that mean, Pastor? That's weird. No, 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 just think like this. Do you have yourself in view? Or what God wants to do with you in view? When you make decisions under pressure, do you pray them out? Or do you say to yourself, if I do this, I'm gonna feel better. And if I feel better, life will be better. And how many of you know that will last for five minutes and then you'll pay the price for five years? D does anybody know what I'm talking about? When you make bad decisions, friends, you live with them. They alter your destiny. Now, I know what happens is they seem so practical and so obvious that you just go, hey, whatever. I got to do this, man. I got to take care of my kids. I got to take care of my family. Got to do the right thing. It just seems so obvious. Well, let me help you with something. If you're going to walk with Jesus, it's not always so obvious. It's not. The things that God is up to sometimes are not practical. They're not obvious, and they're very difficult to discern. You have to stop and what? Come on, somebody say it. You gotta stop and what? And pray, you gotta pray. Well, Pastor, I don't wanna pray, man, I'm hungry. Then go to in and out I'm joking. Uh, l l l listen, listen to what Jesus, he put it this way. He said in Luke 9, 23, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must, she must, they must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. For whoever wishes to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for my sake is the one who will save it. For what if a person to profit if they gain the whole world and they lose or forfeit their soul or themselves? Jesus is really pointed here. He's like, listen, if you make bad decisions and it seems so obvious that you ought to do it, but you lose everything doing it, how smart is that? Hello? But pastor, everybody else is doing it. Now, let me help you. In this story, everybody else wasn't doing it. Everybody didn't move from Bethlehem to Moab. They didn't do that. They, they didn't do it. Because we know that 10 years later, 12 years later, 15 years later, whatever it was, that Naomi went back to Bethlehem because there was food there then. So we know people stayed where? In Bethlehem. There were people who stayed there. So everybody didn't do it. But how many of you know, under pressure, we make bad choices? And see, friends, you gotta figure this out. Life is just a series of choices. Your destiny is set by a series of decisions that you make in the journey. And if you don't take the time to pray them out, you'll end up in trouble. Now, the problem with this story is it's not well thought through. It's not well prayed out. It's not, there's a, there's a guy, Elimelech, from Bethlehem, and he went outside the boundaries that God set for his journey. He went outside the boundaries. So, so, so let me help you with the boundaries. Anybody here want to get blessed? And anybody here really think like this, oh man, God, I really want you to touch my life, touch my business, touch my marriage. Anybody want that? 
That, that's why you come to church, because you want the hand of God in your journey. Well, friends, you don't get the hand of God in your journey unless you do his journey. Did you hear what I just said? God is not about blessing what you want to do. He blesses what he has set before you for eternity. He has a plan for you. He has a destiny for you. And listen, you got to stay in the boundary. You got to stay on your number. You got to be where God wants you to be, not where everybody else is going. Now, how many of you know that's hard, especially when it seems so practical to go the other direction? I mean, come on. There's no food here. They got food over in Moab. I'm going to Moab. Isn't that practical? It just seems so obvious. But friends, it was so obviously wrong. It was very wrong. Why do I know it's wrong? Because if I read the Bible, Numbers 22, 23, 24, 25, all tell me, Deuteronomy tells me, do not hang with the Moabites. Don't go there. Don't marry those people. Don't journey with them. Now, you might be sitting there going, well, that's really kind of racist or something, Pastor, that God wouldn't want his people to be with the Moabites. Let me help you with that. There's a whole backstory on that. The Moabites did some things, and I'll read a little bit of it to you in a, mo in a moment, but the Moabites did some things to the, to the Jews when they were coming out of captivity in Egypt, and it was not okay. God was not okay. He said, listen, you're gonna hang with these people, you're gonna end up in trouble. So don't hang with those people. Now, I know some of you have told your kids the exact same thing, haven't you? Yeah. Hello? Don't hang with those people because when you hang with those people, you always end up where? In trouble. And some of y'all are doing that with your kids. Some of your parents did that with you. They said, don't hang with those people because if you hang with those people, you're gonna end up in trouble. So that was just how it rolled, friends. And the reality was God was doing the same thing with his people. He's saying, don't hang with those people because they worship gods that are not me. They sacrifice their children to gods and you shouldn't do that. They're doing things you shouldn't be doing. If you hang with them, you're gonna end up losing your destiny and end up in trouble. But, 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 Elimelech didn't read those verses. At least if he did, he didn't stay in the boundaries of them and say, God, I wanna stay where you asked me to stay because if I stay in the boundaries, I'm gonna get blessed. But if I go outside of them, I'm not. Do you understand what I'm saying? See, some of you live outside the boundaries of God all the time and you go, I love Jesus, I love God, but, 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 but hold it, who are you following? You following your friends, your neighbors, yourself, the television, the internet, or Jesus? Because friends, the Bible says you're supposed to be a Jesus follower. Hello? Some of you are like this. No, 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 this is really important for you because you're making decisions that jump you out of the boundaries of God and, and, and you end up in trouble. Jesus put it this way. He said the road is narrow that leads to life, but it's wide that leads to destruction. Didn't Jesus say that? That's exactly what I'm saying to you. But pastor, when I'm in the narrow road, it squeezes me. Ah! I totally get that. Don't you hate it? I mean, when you're like, Ugh, why can't I do what everybody else is doing? It looks so much easier out there. Hold, hold it. The road is narrow that leads to life, but it's wide that leads to where? Destruction. It's destruction. Elimelech, friends, took the wide road and it brought death to him and his family. So would he have died if he would have stayed? I, I, I don't know if he would have died if he would have stayed in Israel, I don't know. I know this, he died, and his kids died, and the whole thing went sideways. So, 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 so let me ask you a big question. Why do you go outside the boundaries God sets for your life? I'll answer because I do it sometimes too. I think I'm smarter than God. What about you? Absolutely. It's just practical, it's obvious. I mean, come on, we're hungry over here. There's food over there. This is obvious. We don't need to pray about the obvious, we should just do it. How many know a lot of us live like this? We make our decisions just at what seems right to our own selves, and the Bible's very clear that things that seem right to us are not right. They're not life-giving. 
You gotta be wise, thoughtful, and spirit-led, friends. Everybody in the house wants to get blessed. You do not get blessed unless you chase after God. Now watch this. The decisions you make will choose whether you're in the blessings or you're not. Now here's what happens. You watch everybody else go outside and the road is wide, it looks really comfortable and you're like, wow, look at them go, you know, they're all doing really good and God, you got me like smashed in here. This is really hard and you keep asking me to stay and stay and, and it's hard. And then 10 years later, you crash into those friends and their lives are a mess. And they look at you and go, what happened to you? Man, things look like they've gone really well for you. What happened? <laughs> what, what, watch, here's what happened. I stayed on the road. I stayed on the road where there was blessing and I got what? Blessed. And you went off the road and I wanted to follow you because it looked way better than the narrow place I was in at that moment, but it ended up in destruction. It killed you. It killed your heart, killed your journey, killed your life. So, 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 so why do we do that? Well, here's the answer. It's found in Judges chapter 21, 20, verse 25. It says, in those days there was no king in Israel and everybody did what was right in their own eyes. Just like today. I, I'm just gonna do what I think I should do. It's the best thing for me. How many know there's a theological term for that? What is it? Stupid. Stupid. Don't think like that. That'll just get you into destruction. So point number two in your little outline. There's pressures that made practical just seem right. So, so here's a question for you. How do your families influence your decisions? It's a really important question. Because we'll do things sometimes with our family in view and we'll say, I've got to do this. I mean, this story begins with family decisions. Guy's got two kids, no food, and he makes a decision. I'm, gonna, I'm under pressure, I'm under duress, I have to do the obvious thing, I'm going to Moab. Now, did he think through what that was gonna mean? I, I don't think so. And see, when you make decisions under duress, you can alter your destiny forever. You can change what God had to bless you and it becomes a curse for you because you didn't stay in the boundary. So when you watch this situation and you look at this guy, we're like, huh, huh, what happened? Well, I'll tell you what happened. He only moved 80 miles. 80 miles, some of you are like, well, pastor, I commute further than that every day. Yeah, well, well, this is another world in his day, right? To go 80 miles was like going to another planet in his day, across the desert to Moab. And it changed everything, everything, everything. Now, you know what's so interesting about Elimelech? His name actually means the Lord is my king. And he wasn't. No, he wasn't. His parents wanted him to be, but he wasn't. See, he, I'm guessing he, he must have struggled at some point in the journey to make a decision, and it just seemed so right and so practical that he finally just did it. But friends, you gotta figure this out about Jesus. It's not always obvious and practical what he asked you to do. It's unseen, it's supernatural. You're supposed to live by faith, not by sight. And how many of you know it's way easier to live with what you can see than what you believe? Do you understand what I just said? It's really important for you. It's way easier to live with what you can see than with what you believe. What you believe has to take hold of you deep inside if you're gonna stay on a narrow road. So he makes choices. Were they life-giving choices? No, no, they weren't life-giving choices. If you choose God's way, you will end up paying a price at the beginning and then getting blessed at the end. And so what does that look like for some of you? It looks like, oh, you're in relationships you're not supposed to be in, and you know it. They're killing you, and you don't get out. And the Spirit of God keeps saying to you, get out, get out, get out, get out, and you keep saying, it's okay, it's okay, it's okay, it's okay. No, 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 it's not. It's killing you. See, if you're gonna stay in the narrow road and the boundaries that God has, you're gonna lose some things that you don't wanna lose. 
You're gonna lose some dreams along the way. You might lose a job along the way. You're probably gonna lose some friends along the way. You're gonna lose some things that you want in order to get some things that you never dreamed you could have. Amen. That's how it works. That's how this goes. I mean, I mean, you got an idea in your little peanut, you're like, I know what I'm gonna do. I know who I'm gonna be. I know what I'm stretching for. I know what I'm supposed, do you? Have you prayed it through? Have you trusted God? Are you pressing in? Are you believing that God has a plan for your life to fulfill his destiny in you? Do you believe that? Because when you say yes to God and no to the pressure, everything changes. But you have to say yes to God and no to the pressure. The problem with most of us is we say yes to the pressure and no to God. We fold up underneath the moment. And God wants to say, listen, I know you're getting squeezed. I know the road is narrow, but listen to me. It opens up in this gigantic vista, but you gotta stay in. You gotta stay in, you gotta stay in, you gotta stay in, you gotta stay in. Elimelech didn't stay in, he broke the boundaries. So, 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 so what does that mean? Well, it means that God works when you let him, and if you won't let him, he can't work. Listen to this, here's the problem here. There was a guy named Balak, he was the king of Moab, and he hired Balaam to curse the Israelites, Numbers chapter 22, three and four. The women of Moab uh, hung with the Israeli men and seduced many of them, and they participated in sexual immorality, worshiped their gods, and it says it caused the Lord's anger to burn against his people in Numbers 25. It's no surprise, therefore, that as they entered into the promised land, the people of Israel were commanded not to make treaties or friendships with the Moabites in Deuteronomy 23, verses three, four, five, and six. He basically said this, you get in trouble when you run around with these people, stay away, stay away. So let me ask you a question. Did Elimelech listen? He, he, he said, I, I know better than God, I'm going where there's some food, and what happened? He broke the boundaries around his life. Listen to Psalm 33, 18. Behold, the eye of the Lord is on those who fear him and on those who hope for his loving kindness to deliver their soul from death and keep them alive in a famine. Please listen. Psalm 37, 18 and 19. The Lord knows the day of the blameless and their inheritance will be forever. They will not be ashamed in a time of evil, and in the days of famine, they will have abundance. Friends, your life on a narrow road is boundaried by promises from God. Please hear this. When you're getting squeezed, there are promises that line the boundaries that say, if you can stay in here, you're gonna get blessed. If you can stay in here, I'm gonna take care. Some of you are sitting here going, well, there's no famine. Oh yeah, there is. Some of you are starving to death for things you shouldn't want. You are. You're hungry for things you don't need. You feel be like God betrayed me because he didn't give me all this stuff I need to have. No, 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 no. No, God is trying to protect you from yourself. You need to figure that out. God is trying to help you in the journey to get life. He, God never kills anybody. God's in the business of bringing life to people. The enemy wants to kill and steal and destroy from you. Listen, the promises of God are the boundaries of your life. When you're hungry for something that isn't from God, be careful and be prayerful. It doesn't mean that you can't want things, but when you start wanting them and they start driving your life, you need to get on your face before God and say, God, help me. I don't want to be a slave to this thing and always hungering for this stuff. I want to be free from those things. I want to live freely in you. And God, friends, keeps his word. He will move supernaturally in your little narrow road and he will free you. That's how this works. So, 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 so let's press into this and read the rest of it. It's point number three on your outline. Bad thinking brings death. That's not my idea, that's in the Bible. It was a bad decision, fateful and wrong. He was under duress, he made a decision, and there's always a temptation to do that for all of us. Easy to make bad decisions under pressure. You go outside of God's boundaries and you're in trouble. Proverbs 14, 12 says this very clearly. There's a way that seems right to people, but in the end, its way is death. That's not Dan's idea, that's God's idea. 
When you choose outside the boundaries, it kills you emotionally, it kills you spiritually. In this particular case, there's a picture here, a prophetic picture, it killed them physically. Isaiah 55, eight says this, my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are my ways your ways. For as high as the heavens are over the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. See, you need to pray yourself into your decisions. You need to stop, don't think about what everybody else is doing, stop and say, God, what do you want me to do? I wanna make a decision in light of eternity, not the pressure I feel right now. I don't wanna go and surrender my destiny to pressure. I want you to move with power and authority in my life. Friends, how many know this takes faith? Hello? The Bible says without faith it's what? Impossible to please God. Is it an accident that you're in a narrow place under pressure and it takes faith to make the right decision? No, it's part of the journey. That's how God works in our lives. This is, this is this whole story. When spiritual people function without God, we are left to ourselves unless we allow God to set our direction, veto our plans, we end up in great danger. How many know God sometimes wants to veto your plan? Hello? Yeah. You don't like that, you're like, my plan rocks, Pastor, you don't know my plan, you know. You know what, I'm I'm sure your plan is really the best plan you could ever come up with, but you are not God. God has a better plan for you. He has a better way for you. And if you just do your own thing, friends, you will end up with your own way and it will kill you inside. There are going to be famines and droughts in your journey. Did you hear what I said? There are going to be famines and droughts in your journey. There are going to be times when you are hungering for things you shouldn't have and you're thirsty for things you shouldn't get into. There are going to be famines and droughts in everybody's journey. That's how this goes. You're like, yeah, but you don't know my story, Pastor. I I don't know your story, but God does. And I know Jesus said this, Seek ye first the kingdom of God, and his righteousness, and he will add what? Everything back to you that you need. Everything. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. He'll give back to you everything that you lost and you gave up. He'll, he'll, he'll bless you in ways you can't even imagine. So here's a question under pressure. Where are you going to turn? Where are you going to go for your decisions? Are you going to go outside the boundaries of God or stay inside the boundaries of God? Because the truth is, the death, his death, And what came of his sons was a huge, gigantic tragedy. Let let me read this to you. His death left his family in Moab with the result that his sons married Moabite women named Orpah and Ruth. Given the past history with Moab and Moabite women that had led the men of Israel astray and caused them to worship other gods, this could never have been a wise thing to do. Throughout scripture, the Lord's people are commanded repeatedly not to marry outside of his people. So Malon and Kilion would never have married Moabite women if Elimelech had not taken his family to Moab. To Moab. So the decisions by his parents, by, by him as a parent, impacted his children. So here's a big thought for some of you. Do you have your children's destiny in view when you're making your decisions? Do you have your family in view when you're making your life decisions? Are you thinking, okay, this might work really well for me, but it could end up destroying my kids. Because you ought to think that way in all of your decisions. You've got to pray them, pray them, pray them through. Now, how many of you know, if you allow your desires to dictate your direction, you can end up dead? I mean, I've spent the last 30 minutes saying that, haven't I? Hello? You're like, yes, hurry up, please. You know, you're killing me. You know, but, 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 but have, have I not made a case? Yes or no? Yes. So let me, let me tell you something. We're going to wrap this up right now, but let me explain something to you. I made a case on purpose. I built this as big as I could on purpose because it's all there. And you know what else is there? After all these dumb decisions that they made and all the havoc that they reaped and sowed, God still rescued them. Come on. That's what makes God so amazing. God still rescued him. 
God didn't abandon him. He's not going to abandon you. Doesn't matter how many bad decisions you make. God will still come and rescue you as, as soon as you turn and say, help me. I'm Help me. I made bad choices, God. Help me. See, the truth is this. The Spirit of God wants to touch you and turn you from the world into the heart of the Father. So let me read this, and we'll wrap it up. Watch where this goes. It says in verse 5, both Malon and Kilion died, and the women the women were bereft of two children and her husband. This is a horrible-looking picture. Verse 6. And she arose with her daughters-in-law that she might return from the land of Moab because she had heard in the land of Moab that the Lord had visited his people and giving them food in Bethlehem. So she departed from the place where she was and her two daughters-in-law were with her and they went on their way to return to the land of Judah. So you gotta get this picture in your head. You got three widows that have no social network underneath them whatsoever. So they may be completely broke. We know there was nobody to rescue them. There was no way when the men were dead for them to take care of themselves in this culture. That was the picture. But you got three women and they're about ready to walk 80 miles across what? The desert, are you kidding? So they're out on a dusty road in the middle of nowhere, likely leaving town and headed towards Bethlehem. And the three of them are walking along. It says she departed the place with her two daughters law and they went to return to the land of Judah. And Naomi then stopped somewhere on the trail and she said, this is a bad idea. You guys really shouldn't come with me. She looked at her two daughters in law and said, go return to each of you to your mother's home. And may the Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. And may the Lord grant you that you may find rest, each of you, in the house of your husband. So, 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 hold it, you gotta get this. She's talking about Yahweh. She's talking about Jehovah God. So clearly, she's explained her faith over the years to these girls. Do you understand that? She explained clearly that she worshiped a God different than the gods of Moab, Balaam. She, she was very clear about that, and she said, go back. To your, to your family's homes. And she says, there's nothing here for you. May the Lord grant you to find rest and a husband because if you come with me, you're not gonna find a husband because all the people in Israel are smarter than me and they won't let their boys date you. That's what she's saying. What, what, watch this. Go return each of you to your mother's house. May the Lord deal kindly with you and grant you that you could find rest in a husband. She kissed them and they lifted up their voices and they wept. Well, of course they did. There's three girls here. No, I'm joking. I love you guys. I'm joking. You're going to get up and leave now? Send me an email. I'm just playing. Okay. I, it's there. Okay. So let's keep going. Verse 10. It says, and they said to her, no, but we will surely return with you to your people. But Naomi said, are you kidding? You're gonna go home, girls. Why would you go with me? I, I, I don't have any sons in my womb that they could be your husbands. Go and return, daughters, for I'm too old to have a husband. And if I even said I, I did, if I should have a husband and, and have two sons, where, how, where would you be? How old, by the time they're grown up, how old would you be? And, and would you refrain from marrying? No, my daughters, it's harder for me than for you, for the hand of the Lord has gone forth against me. So you gotta get this picture. Naomi is not a spirit-led person. Naomi is not a faith-filled person. Naomi is a bitter lady, and she says that about herself in the next few verses. She actually says, I am bitter. I, came, I went out full, and I came home bitter, angry at God, angry at life. And some of you are there right now. You've made the bad choice, and then you get mad at God for it. And now you're mad at me for telling you that. No, really, that's what's happened in your journey. You know, you've made your own decisions and then you're ticked off at God about it. That was the picture of Naomi here. Now, you gotta understand clearly what she just said to the girls. She said, look, if I had some more boys, I would let them date you. But nobody else in Israel is going to do that. So go back and find some Moabite guy to marry you because nobody in Israel is gonna marry you because it's forbidden. So clearly she knew that to allow her sons to marry these women was what? Wrong. She knew that. She knew it was wrong, but she broke the boundary anyway. How many of you know the word says over and over, over and over, over and over, break the boundaries, pay the price. 
You're gonna lose your destiny, it's gonna get, you're gonna get hurt, you're gonna be wounded in the journey, it's not gonna be a happy day for you, but she obviously chose to do that. So when you, when you go through this and you start to see it, you're like, whew, what happened? All of them lost their husbands. They're all in huge pain. They're all crying on the side of the road. They've all experienced death. And now she tells him something really interesting. Go back to your own people, your own God. Listen to this. Verse 14. They lifted up their voices and they wept again. And Orpah kissed her mother-in-law and went back but Ruth clung to her. This is a really important verse and a really important word because this is a picture of a destiny that got changed. Ruth, it says, clung to her. It's the same word that you find in Genesis chapter two when it says um, a man will leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife. It's the same word. It means there's gonna be such a deep attachment that you can't tear the person away. And literally, literally, Ruth has grabbed a hold of Naomi and said, look it, I have made my decision. I am all in with you. I'm not going anywhere else. I'm all in with you. And then she starts to explain what that looks like for her. Please listen to her words because she makes a really deep, thoughtful, and spiritual decision. She said to her, behold, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and listen to this, and her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. So here's Naomi, bless her heart. Go home, find a husband with your guys. Even though you're gonna perish in eternity, it's okay. That's what she just said. You know, go back to your own gods. They're, they're really evil, cultish gods. Go back to them anyway and, 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 and follow your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, and this is a game changer, do not urge me to leave you or turn back from following you. For where you go, I will go. And where you lodge, I will lodge. And your people shall be my people. Are you kidding? The Bible says her people cannot be your people. Is that right or not? I, I read you the verse. It says that. You can go into Numbers 22, 3, 4, 5. You can go into Deuteronomy. It says you should not be with these people. But now listen to me. You've got to figure out the heart of God here because there's this huge picture. Mercy triumphs over justice for God. Always. When you, when you do what Ruth did in this story, you break everything. You blow up your heavenly father so big that you become irresistible to him. He is dying for people who are dying for him. He wants you to grab a hold and say, no matter what happens, I'm in. I'm with you. You cannot get me to go back. I don't want to go back. There's nothing to go back to. I'm 100% in. There's nowhere else to go but to Jesus. That's the story. That's what makes Ruth incredible. That's what makes her life worth studying because she figured out something most of us still haven't figured out. Don't surrender to the world. Give yourself to Jesus 100% and there's no way back. Don't ever turn back. There's no turning back. Listen to what she said. I love this verse. My wife engraved this verse in my wedding ring. It's still there today. It says, where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people and your God will be my God. Where you die, I will die and there I will be buried. Thus, may the Lord, she just used Yahweh's name. She just said, thus may your God do to me and worse, if anything but death parts you and me. And when she saw that she was determined to go with her, she said no more to her. And they went on their way, they came to Bethlehem. When they came to Bethlehem, the city was stirred because of them, and the women said, is this Naomi? And she said, don't call me Naomi, call me Mara, because the Lord Almighty has dealt bitterly with me. I went out full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. You went out clueless and disobedient, you came back worse. That's what happened. Do you understand that's what happens when you get lost in your own way? Stand with me, would you? I want you to bow your head and ask the Holy Spirit to speak to you. Some of you are hungering for things that are gonna kill you. You're in the middle of a famine and you think there's no hope. 
Ruth was out on a dusty road all by herself. Nobody around but Naomi and her. And she made a decision that changed history. She said, I'm going to do this no matter what. She ends up marrying Boaz. Most of you know the story. But many of you don't understand why Boaz was so open to marry Ruth is because Boaz understood Ruth's story because his story was the same. His grandmother was Rahab the harlot, who was not a Jew either. He knew the mercy of God and the grace of God in the middle of a very, very difficult situation. Some of you have never experienced God like that. Your hunger has caused you to chase after things that have killed your destiny, killed your heart. The darkness around us can impact us so deeply. We creep out of the boundaries of God and into the shadows and we get crushed. Ruth figured out something that some of us need to figure out in the next few weeks as we study her life. You hold on to God at every, every turn, every pressure point. You cling and you never look back and God will rescue you. He'll do things for you that you could never have dreamt would happen. Ruth the Moabite who was forbidden to go to Israel and be with Israelites, became the great, great grandmother of Jesus. Because God is crazy about people who cling to him. Now, if you're here today and you know you're outside of the boundaries of God in your life, I'm not gonna have an altar call right now, but I wanna pray for you, so I want you to put your hand up. If that's you and you know that the Lord has spoken to you about relationships, situations, things you're hungry for. Good for you. There's lots and lots of us. Things that are killing you right now. Father, we come to you with all these folks that have lifted their hands all over the auditorium, people online, people on other campuses, God, and we say, help us, Holy Spirit. Without you, we have nothing. You said that if we would repent, turn back from our bad choices, that you would heal us and restore us and redeem us. But that we have to choose to turn back. And so I pray right now for grace, courage, life, and people that are living in places they know they shouldn't be, that have made decisions they know are killing them, that they would turn back today. That you, Father, would touch them, Holy Spirit, you would brood over them, you would rest on their hearts, you would just be relentless with them, Father. Don't let them go back outside the boundaries. Pull them back into your heart, Father, and heal them in the name of Jesus. And everybody said, now some of you need prayer before you go home. We're gonna have a team of people up here to pray for you, love to invite you up here. God bless you, have a great week. Well, what a powerful message that was today to kick off our series on Ruth. Just an awesome way to start this series. Um, just hearing that message on our decisions and how um, direction and our destiny and how um, just that all impacts everything. This, the uh, how he said about staying in the in the boundaries of of God. That was really really powerful to hear, and um, really the challenge to um, and call to walk by faith um, and not by sight. What was your favorite part, Jesus? Yeah, I think there was a few things there that I kind of walk away with, and it's definitely one of the messages that you you walk away with and you continue to reflect on. Yeah. But in our decision making, are we making decisions with eternity in mind? And that's mm -hmm. that's huge because 
oftentimes when we make decisions, we are looking to, uh, at what's the most practical. And I love that Pastor Dan said that sometimes with God, the, the decisions that we might have to make because we know where he's leading don't come across as practical often. Yeah. And it reminded me of a verse in Isaiah 55, 8, where it says, my thoughts are nothing like your thoughts, says the Lord, and my ways are far beyond anything you could imagine. And it's just an awesome reminder that in everything that we do to go before the Lord and just to be cognizant of that. And, you know, what I, what I also loved about it was, you know, I, there, it wasn't just left, like, if you made a bad decision, that's it. Yeah. There's hope there. Absolutely. Right. Absolutely. And so if that's you, if you are one of those people that would just love prayer, um, we would love to connect with you. We have prayers, right? Or sorry, we have pastors ready to pray with you right now. Um, just click the prayer button and um, we have the phones ready and people ready to just be there to pray with you um, about what we just talked about today. If, if that's you, I know Pastor Jen specifically asked people to raise their hand if um, they're, they are outside of those boundaries. Um, of God. And so if that's you, then we encourage you just to tune in and um, plug into our prayer community online. Yeah. And can we do this? Can we pray for you guys right now? Maybe there's some of us out there who, um, well, we've all done it. We've all made bad decisions. We've all walked outside of the boundaries and the enemy does a really good job of trying to condemn us yeah. in those moments of really feeling like, man, God won't understand. He won't he won't let you come back. And we know that's not the reality. Our God is a God who is just, he is graceful, he is forgiving, and he wants you to come back to him. So let's uh, close out our service in prayer this morning. Can we do that? Yeah, absolutely. Right. Uh, Father God, we just come before you, Lord. Lord, thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your mercy. And Lord, we want to pray specifically for anyone out in our online community right now who have walked outside of those boundaries you've set for them. Lord, that maybe they made a decision uh, out of haste, maybe out of anger, out of frustration, Lord, knowing, God, that that wasn't the direction you wanted them to go to. And Father, we pray for them that they would know, Lord, beyond a shadow of a doubt, that you love them, that you care for them, Lord God. God, that you're not telling them they can't come back, but Lord, you're saying, repent, come to me ask for forgiveness and that you will give that freely, Lord. Lord, would they know that there is hope in you, Jesus, and that there is nothing that we can do to, to separate ourselves from your love, Lord. Lord, we love you. We thank you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God Amen. bless you guys. It was great being here with you today, and we will see you guys next week.